Okay, good afternoon, everyone, or whatever time it is where you are tuning in from. Welcome to the Berlin Epidemiological Methods Colloquium. My name is Jess Roman, and together with Toivo Glatz, Tobias Kurt, Chisato Ito, and Megan Forrest, we are bringing you this hybrid session today. So we're very happy to have some people with us today here in Berlin and also a number of participants from around the globe. Um, I'm very, very pleased to uh, welcome our speaker, which I'll do in just a moment. But I know that there are quite some new attendees to the colloquium today. So I just wanted to tell you a little bit about us. We're generally doing this once a month, uh, these talks on the first Wednesday of the month. This is an extra special uh, second talk in September. And we're also launching a new journal club. So you can find information about all of our upcoming talks and journal clubs on our website, bemcolloquiumwrittentogether.com. Okay, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's speaker. We have Dr. Marco Piccinini, who is a researcher at the Institute of Public Health at the Charité, as well as the Center for Stroke Research in Berlin. He has training as a biostatistician and completed the PhD program in health data sciences. He's very interested at the intersection of causal inference and risk prediction modeling, which I think uh, will be nice uh, topics you'll find neatly in his talk today. Without further ado, Marco, over to you. Oh, and I should mention, actually, we will have a Q&A session at the end of the talk today. We're recording just the talk part, so please do uh, stick around. If you have questions, you can already write them. If you're using the Zoom webinar in the Q&A button at the bottom of the webinar uh, window, or if you're in person here today, we will also bring around a mic for questions at the end. Marco, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me. It's a great honor to be on this side of the bank for once. So I'm Marco Piccini, and my talk today is called A Causal Perspective on Age Education Correction in Cognitive Screening Tests. Uh, these are my potential conflicts of interest, and I would like to start by talking about what's the idea of the project, how actually the project started. So between 2016, and 2018, I was working as a biostatistician in a research center for neurodegenerative diseases. And in this center, there was quite a strong scientific debate between two groups of neuropsychologists. So on the, the issue they were debating on was which method is the best to correct for age and education in neuropsychological tests. So one side, one group of neuropsychologists uh, claimed that the best method to correct for age and education was the so-called Z-score or Z-score. And the other group of neuropsychologists was actually arguing that the best method to correct for neuropsychological tests was the so-called equivalent score. Uh, this is a, a method that is more commonly used in Italy where the center was. And so as the bio statistician of the center, uh, my task was to try to figure out which one of the two methods is the best. So that's how my travel into the correction for age education world started. So what is the age education correction? So let's start by defining the cognitive screen test. So a cognitive screen test is a tool that is used to screen for dementia or cognitive impairment. And the most the most commonly used or the most known is the mini mental state examination, which I think most of you encountered at some point in the literature. And usually when you, uh, when an individual performs, like does a test, the result of the test is a number. So you have a numeric result of the test that summarizes the, performer, the performance of the individual on the test. And the raw test score is exactly this. So it's the number that, it, that summarizes the performance of the individual. And this is usually something like the number of correct answers, the number of errors or the time needed, or sometimes the sum of the scores of, of the single items. Usually the raw score is not used for the interpretation, at least not directly. So what you have is that the raw test score that you get from a new individual is compared with norms or standards from individuals with similar demographic characteristics. And usually 
the demographic characteristics are variables like age, sex, ethnicity, or education. To make this comparison more explicit between the individual ROTA score and the normative sample with the same demographic characteristic, the ROTA score is generally transformed into another score, which is called the corrected score. And this transformation is sometimes called correction, standardization, or adjustment. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the Z-score, which is the most commonly used type of correction for neuropsychological tests. So how does it work? So you first administer the test to a normative sample. So you take a group of individuals without the condition of interest, and they perform the test. They represent your normative sample. And what you want to do eventually is to compare the new individual score to the distribution of the row test scores of the individuals in the normative sample with similar demographic. And to make this passage, this step easier, you just compute the Z-score. So the Z-score is the distance between an individual's performance and the average performance of the group of individuals from the normative sample with similar demographics measures in units of this group's standard deviation. And this seems a little bit complicated, but actually uh, the intuition is fairly simple. So let's look at it in a graphical way. So let's imagine that we have a specific demographic group. So we have individuals between 50 and 55 with three to five years of education. And let's imagine that we have a normative sample and we collected data about the performance of this normative sample in this specific uh, demographic group. Let's imagine that on average, the individuals in this demographic group have a score of 40. And let's imagine that the standard deviation is 10. Let's assume further that the distribution of the scores is normal. So the distribution of the ROTA score in the normative sample for this demographic group looks something like this bell-shaped curve, right? And now let's imagine that we have a new individual. Uh, this individual performs 20. And we want to compute the Z score for this individual, which means we want to correct for age and education uh, for this individual. What do we do? We take 20, we subtract the mean of the same demographic group in the normative sample, and then we divide by the standard deviation. So we do 20 minus 40 divided by 10 minus two. Uh, why is this useful? Or why should I go through the trouble of doing additional math for interpreting a test? So the idea is that there is a one-to-one -one relationship between the Z-score and the probability that an individual would perform worse or equal to that, uh, to that performance in the normative sample in, for the same demographic characteristics. So, for example, if I say that the individual has a Z-score of minus two, this immediately means that uh, there are only the probability for an individual without the condition of interest in the same demographic group is only 2.3% of performing worse or equal to that performance. So we immediately can translate the minus two into the concept of it's very rare to observe this performance in the normative sample for a group of individuals with the same demographics. And that's why it's, uh, the Z-score is very used in practice. The idea is that the neuropsychologist would say, OK, so this result is actually very rare for a person with these demographic characteristics without the condition of interest. So the neuropsychology infers that maybe the individual has a cognitive, has cognitive impairment. This is a, a little bit like the logic of the p-value. I, um, I will not go too much into details, but I hope you got the intuition. So the Z-score is the most commonly encountered example of correction in practice. And this is because the Z-score has very neat and convenient statistical properties. So it's very easy to interpret. We rely, when we compute the Z-score, on the assumption of normality, as you uh, saw before in the plot. There are also model-based alternative 
uh, to the Z score, like for example, the equivalent score, which I was mentioning before, which is a model based alternative for the age education correction or in general for the demographic correction. Uh, but I want to highlight that all of these techniques actually have the same underlying reasoning. So I want to try to make a statement now and then try to make you understand the statement in an intuitive way without going too much into the details. We will see this more in details later. So the correction, and I will focus now on age education correction because age education correction is um, most, it's the most used uh, correction for neuropsychological tests and specifically for cognitive screening tests. So the correction can be interpreted as removing the component of the row score that is attributable to age and education. So to make that this clear, let's look at an example. So on the left now, you see the example that I used before. So a demographic group, 50, 55 of age with education level three to five years of education. And we said that these individuals have, without the condition of interest, have a average score or 40. Let's now imagine that we have another demographic group, which is characterized by higher age and lower education. So specifically, we have an age group of 70, 75, and education level between zero and three years of education. So usually a cognitive screen test works in a simple way. The lower the score, the worse the performance. The higher the score, the higher the performance. So we know, uh, from the literature and also from common sense that even without the condition of interest, so even without cognitive impairment, the higher the age the, and the lower the education, the worse will be the performance in the cognitive screening test. So let's imagine for now that this uh, demographic group, which is characterized by higher age and lower education as an average in the normative sample of 20. Let's imagine that the standard deviation is the same, so we, things are a bit easier. So what you see now is, as before, we have the curve here of, with the data from the normative sample for this specific demographic group. And you can see now that to obtain a z-score of minus two, an individual in this demographic group needs to score zero at the test or very close to zero. On the other end, well, actually it's zero exactly, yes. In the previous demographic group, since the performance were on average better among the, um, in, in, the same, in the demographic group, 50, 55, three to five years of education, um, you see that to have a Z score of minus two, you need to perform 20 in the test performance. So what you notice is that an individual who is older and with a lower education level will be first classified as impaired at a lower score than a younger educated person. So this is the intuition why you can immediately understand that uh, the correction can be interpreted as removing the component of the row scores that is, that is attributable to age and education. And almost all tests for cognitive impairment are actually corrected or adjusted for age and education. What is the rationale for doing this? So there is a philosophical argument and a statistical argument. I will briefly mention the philosophical argument, then I will actually focus on the statistical one because I'm a statistician. So the philosophical argument is the struggle between two different uh, conceptualization of aging. So you have the lifespan development theory, which in a nutshell says that some degree of cognitive impairment um, during the process of aging is actually uh, physiological. So it should, it should not be seen as a disease or a medical condition. On the other end, you have the biological aging model, which claims in a nutshell that any the loss of cognitive performance is actually a medical condition and we should address it. So you can see already that if you believe in the lifespan development theory, it makes sense to correct for age. 
because you want to consider a certain degree of worsening of the test performance as physiological. While if you believe more to the biological aging model, then you should not correct for age. I will not spend too much time on the philosophical argument. I only will say that this makes sense for age, but it doesn't make a lot of sense for education. So the statistical argument, this is something that goes, is a reasoning that goes as follow. So age and education impact the test performance. And removing the component of the scores that are due to these two variables will therefore reduce the variance of the scores because these variables basically induce some noise. And if we correct for these variables, we will delete some noise. And deleting noise, noise means reducing the variability within the two groups, which means increasing the discrimination. This seems a bit abstract. Maybe we, we can look at it in practice pretty easily. So imagine that you have a group of individuals with the impairment, which are in blue, and a group of individuals without the cognitive impairment, which are in red. As we said before, we expect individuals with the cognitive impairment to perform worse, which means to perform, to have scores generally lower. So you see that the, um, that the blue curve is actually on the left. Okay, so this is, these are data simulated under the assumption that the test performance, actually the Rose test score, only be, depends on age, education, and the fact that you have cognitive impairment. So you see that when you correct for age and education, the two curves have less overlap compared to before. And this means that now you have higher discrimination performance. You, you are better able to discriminate individuals in one group compared to the other group. This seems a very neat and sound rational, and I also showed uh, a graphical idea of why this makes sense, but this is not really the reality. It's, let's say it's not all of the reality. Already in 1996, you can see this paper from Bell et al. that says, Overall, the adjusted criteria did not perform as well as the unadjusted criteria in this sample. So they are referring to the fact that in their study, they found empirically that the corrected score was actually performing worse than the row test score. And again, in 1998, if the criterion is to identify the most accurate screening procedure for each sociodemographic subgroup, the evidence indicates that the unadjusted scores are preferable. So once again, empirically, they found that the ROTA score was better than the corrected score. Or, or again, more recently, 2011, correcting the 3MS, which is another um, neuropsychological test for bias, does not improve accuracy when screening for cognitive impairment or dementia. And there are other papers who actually agreed uh, with this finding. So that empirically found that correction was not really working as expected. So the discrimination performance were becoming lower. And this seems a little bit of a paradox, right? Because I just told you that to create the corrected score, we use three information, age, education, and the ROTA score. While the ROTA score is just one, information, right? So the, it's a bit counterintuitive, the fact that you use more information, but you end up having less discrimination performance. So it's like if you use more information, but you end up knowing less about the individual. And this is the first reaction uh, I actually got when I tried to uh, explain this issue to a neuropsychologist. So this was the immediate reaction. How is it possible to create the corrected score, I actually account for age, education, and the road test score. So I should have more information. Uh, why is this happening? So in the literature, you can find some intuitions that in my opinion are brilliant. Um, a group of like different researchers in different times, like Berkman, Lewinsky, and O'Connell and Tuocco, uh, told that since age and education do not only impact the test performance, but also the probability of the cognitive impairment, 
then deleting the effect of these variables on the test score may cause a loss of information and consequently a reduced accuracy. O'Connell and Tuocco actually even did a simulation study showing this. So you see here this plot. So you have on the y-axis, the difference in the area under the curve between the row test score and the corrected score. So the area under the curve is a metric that is uh, commonly used for measuring the discrimination performance. And so they take the difference in percentage between the R under the curve of the row score minus the R under the curve of the corrected score. And they plot this difference while changing the association between the demographic variables and the diagnosis, so and the cognitive impairment or the dementia. And what they found is that the stronger is the association between the demographic variables and the diagnosis, the better the row test is compared to the corrected one. And what you see also on reading this intuition or looking at this plot is that this is actually a causal problem. And you probably already understood that by the fact that I was unable to convey the messages without using terms such as impact, effect, or attributable. Um, indeed, we really believe that uh, one of the reasons why uh, there were these papers finding that the corrected score was actually worse than the ROTA score, but there were also some uh, researchers coming up with a theory why this was happening, this didn't induce any change in the clinical practice. So still nowadays, the corrected score is the score to go in the clinical practice. And we think that one of the reasons why uh, this change didn't happen or that this criticism wasn't really debated uh, at a deeper level was the lack of an explicit causal framework. So without an explicit causal framework, this problem is not really so intuitive and we lack a complete understanding of it. So the aim of this project was to take an explicit causal approach to address this debate uh, regarding the prediction performance. And here I want to open a small parenthesis because this may be a little bit confusing maybe. Uh, from the beginning of the, the end of the 80s, the beginning of the 90s, uh, when the so-called causal revolution happened, prediction modeling and causal inference have been seen as two very separate domains. So causal inference typically associated with human knowledge. So what do you know about causal processes in the world? And prediction modeling more associated with data-driven procedures like machine learning, for example. In recent years, uh, a new field uh, developed, which is the field of causal learning or causal discovery, which uses uh, prediction modeling technique like machine learning algorithm to actually learn causal structure. And the focus of my research is exactly the other way around. So can we use causal knowledge to inform prediction modeling strategies? And we already show that actually using uh, causal inference tools like DAGs, directed acyclic graphs, or using counterfactual thinking and causal thinking can help prediction modeling uh, strategies, especially with the regards of assessing transportability on sele or selecting predictors for your risk prediction model. So we just said that maybe directed acyclic graphs can help in figuring out prediction, uh, the best prediction modeling strategy. So let's start with a DAG. So what is a DAG? A DAG is a graphical tool it's a compact way to represent what we know about the world. Uh, and it's very easy to read, but entails some uh, statistical properties of the variables. So it's very convenient. So in this deck, we have four nodes. The first node is A, age. The second no node is D, which stands for the cognitive impairment, and E, which stands for education, and X, which represents the row test score. We already said that age, uh, age is a risk factor for uh, cognitive impairment. So we draw this arrow here from age to cognitive impairment. But we also said that age, regardless of the cognitive impairment, affects the test performance. So we also draw this arrow here from A to X. 
And similarly, we said that education affects the cognitive impairment, so the likelihood of developing cognitive impairment in a causal way. So we draw the arrow between E and D. And we said that also education affects the result of the test score, of the test performance. So we also draw an arrow between E and X. And finally, obviously, the test is built to uh, also um, depend on the fact that you have cognitive impairment, yes or no. So D is this binary variable, and we put an arrow between D and X, so between cognitive impairment and the test performance. This is a very simple DAG, but also explains why agent education are typically called confounders of the relationship between the cognitive impairment and the test score. Uh, so the association that we have between D cognitive impairment and X, the test score, depends on three different paths, two non-causal paths and one causal path. The two non-causal paths are, well, first, the one that goes through A, so the one that you see here, D to A, A to X. The second non-causal path is the one that goes from D to E and to E, uh, to e from E to X, sorry. And then you have one causal path, which is the blue arrow that goes from D to X. Uh, the association that you will find in the data between D and X will actually depend will actually depend on jointly on all of these three paths. And let's try to understand intuitively what happens when we apply the age education correction. So when we correct for age and education, we said before that we try to remove the effect of age and education on the test score. So what we are doing with the correction is trying to delete those two arrows here, so the one that goes from A to X and the one that goes from E to X. And we delete these two arrows. So if this is the true DAG, uh, we can see now that destroying these two arrows, so deleting these two arrow, will actually break the two non-causal paths. So now there is no more a path that goes from D to A to and from A to X. And there is no, also, there is not anymore also the other non-causal path, the one that goes from D to E and from E to X. And this causes a loss of information because now the association is changing. And you cannot already understand from the DAG in which direction the loss of information will go, but uh, we will see this more in detail later. The idea is that given the signs of the causal effects of these arrows, so knowing which type of relationship these variables have, we can tell that this loss of information translates into a lower discrimination performance. And now let's look at another example. So let's imagine that we live in a world in which age and education are not a risk factor for cognitive impairment. So if this is true, there is no arrow between A and D, and there is, not arrow, there is no arrow between E and D. And if these two arrows do not exist, A and E only induce noise into the test performance, so into the test score. So the moment we delete these two variables, we delete, not these two variables, we delete these two arrows the, when we apply the correction. So we remove the arrow that goes from A to X and from E to X, we will have less noise in the test performance. So the variability will be reduced and therefore we will end up with a higher discrimination performance. And this is what we saw in the example I uh, showed you before. So as I said, it's not, so it's possible to understand from the DAG that when you apply the correction, intuitively the association between the cognitive impairment and the test performance changes but you cannot really tell in which direction this will go. So to understand this, we need to go uh, a level farther. So we need to fully specify our causal model, which means that we will attribute some distribution and functional relationships to the arrows we have in the DAG. So let's imagine that A as a generic distribution PA, uh, E as a generic distribution PE, and now, sorry about this, but I will introduce a bunch of formulas. So the cognitive impairment 
is a binary variable. And this binary variable has a probability that depends as a logistic function, we assume this, uh, on age and education. And we know that the higher the age, the uh, higher the probability that you will, that you have cognitive impairment. So gamma one is positive or is greater or equal than zero. Let's assume this. And the higher the education, the lower the probability that you have cognitive impairment. So gamma two is lower or equal than zero. Let's also define the function for the test score. So let's say the simplest function that the test score is a linear function of age, education, and cognitive impairment. So we know that if age increases, then the test performance will go down because you will have worse cognitive performance, worse test performance. So beta one is lower or equal than zero. We will assume this. Uh, if the education goes up, we know that the test performance will also go up. So beta two is actually greater or equal than zero. And finally, we know that if you have cognitive impairment, the test performance will go down. So we assume that beta three is lower or equal than zero. Once we define these two variables, uh, sorry, this, yeah, these two uh, elements in our DAG, we can also define the corrected score. So the corrected score is just the ROTA score minus the expected average of the row test performance in the group of individuals with the same age and education without the condition of interest. And this corresponds to beta zero plus beta one times A plus beta two times E. What's our, what's our question? So our question is to try to figure out what is the R under the curve of the row test score minus the R under the curve of the corrected score. We will use the same metric that uh, O'Connell and Tuocco used in their simulation in the plot I showed you before. So our, like our aim is trying to figure out what is this quantity, what is this difference? Which of the two tests has the higher R under the curve? This becomes a little bit complicated. I will just guide you through it and with some, um, you don't need to follow all the formulas. I will just give you the intuition of it. So we start with the definition of the R under the curve. So you probably heard that the R under the curve is the probability that if you draw at random one individual from the group with the impairment, this individual has a lower score than the score that an individual drawn at random from the group without impairment has. So this is what the first line means. Then we will just replace x1 and x0 with the function that I showed you before. So uh, with the definition of the row test score as a function of age, education, and the cognitive impairment. And then we realize that actually this quantity has an, an, is an average of some probabilities. And this is what we get. For now, it's not really important to follow the mathematical steps. What's important is that we figure out two things. Uh, the first thing is that the R under the curve of the row test performance depend on, depends on several parameters. So it depends on beta one, on beta two, on beta three, on gamma one, and gamma two, plus other things. So the discrimination performance of the row test score depends on what is the relationship between age and cognitive impairment, between age and the test score, between education and the cognitive impairment, and between education and the test score. So it doesn't, depends on the whole, uh, the whole combination of causal effects. And the second thing is that uh, you see here, uh, I didn't spend too much time, but I said that X was a linear function and that linear function had a normal, normally distributed error, epsilon. So we know that epsilon zero is normally distributed, epsilon one is normally distributed. And we also know from the theory that the difference of two normal distribution is still a normal distribution. So we can see here that the R under the curve of the row test score is actually an average, but for now let's forget uh, the fact that it's an average of the probability that a specific normal distribution, 
is higher than this quantity here. And that's everything you need to remember from this slide. We will come back to this later. Then we do the same thing for the corrected score. So for Z, the R under the cure of Z, we follow the same steps. Uh, luckily this time, uh, the, uh, the formula is a bit easier. So the R under the curve of the corrected score is just equal to this probability here. And the probability is the probability that the same normal distribution as before is higher than beta three. And we also additionally notice that beta three is actually the only parameter that you see for in the formula for the R under the curve of the corrected score. And this is a bit like the intuition I told you before. So when you delete the effect of age and, age and education on the test performance, you only are left with one arrow with, from D to X. And the arrow is the causal effect of D on X. So the causal effect of the cognitive impairment on the test score. And this, this uh, effect was exactly beta three. So now we see that the R under the curve of the corrected score is actually just equal to a function of beta three. So of the effect that the cognitive impairment has on the test performance. So as I said, um, the R under the curve of the row score depends on many factors. So the effect of age and education on cognitive impairment and the effect of age and education on the test score. While the R under the curve of the corrected score depends only on the effects of the cognitive impairment on the test score. But what is the direction of the difference? So how do we compute the difference between these two uh, equations? So with, between these two quantities? Well, it's not that easy uh, in the sense that, as you saw, the formula for the R under the curve of the row score is a bit complicated. It's actually a quadruple, quadruple integral, so it's a bit difficult to solve. But I will give you already now an intuition, and then we will have uh, a numerical analysis later. So I said at the beginning, not at really the beginning, I said a few slides ago, that the R under the curve of the row test score is the probability of observing uh, a quantity higher than this quantity here in a normal distribution. So the R under the curve of the row test score is the distribution, is the uh, part at the right of this normal distribution. Um, so we are, let me rephrase it. Maybe it was a bit confusing. So, oops, one second. Yes. Uh, so the R under the curve of the row test performance is actually the average of a certain probability. For now, let's forget the average. So let's imagine that the R under the curve of the row test score is just the probability of observing a quantity higher than this guy here in a normal distribution. So graphically, it means the R under the curve of the row test score is the area at the right of this line. So defined by this quantity. The R under the curve of the corrected score instead is the area at the right. Because remember, it was the same thing. It was the probability that the same normal distribution is higher than beta three. So it's actually equal to the area below the same normal distribution that is on the right of beta three. So the point to figure out which one of the two R under the curve is higher is just to figure out which one of these two quantities here is higher, is more on the left, right? So if beta three is on the right, it means that the R under the curve of the corrected score is worse. If beta three is on the left, it means that the R under the curve of the corrected score is higher, generally. So to understand this, we just need to go back to the direction we assumed in the parameters. So we said that beta one was negative and we said that age is a risk factor for cognitive impairment. If age is a risk factor for cognitive impairment, it means that A1, so A1 is just the age that you have typically in, the, in an individual with the cognitive impairment. A0 is the typical age 
for an individual without cognitive impairment. So if I say that age is a risk factor for cognitive impairment, it means that I generally expect an individual with cognitive impairment to have a higher age compared to an individual without. So I expect A1 minus A0 to be positive. And for education, it works the other way around. So we said that if you are educated, you are less likely to have cognitive impairment. So E1 is generally expected to be uh, higher in the individuals, sorry, E is generally expected to be higher in individual without cognitive, individuals without cognitive impairment. So E1 minus E0 is uh, negative. And we said that beta 1, at the beginning, we said that beta 1 is negative or equal to 0. Beta 2 is positive or equal to 0. So here we have something negative that multiplies something positive plus something uh, positive that multiplies something negative. So this old piece here is generally negative. So it means that we the R under the curve of the row test score is just beta the area under this normal distribution at the right of beta 3 minus something. And the area under the curve of the corrected score is just the area, area under the same normal distribution at the right of beta 3. So if this quantity here is lower than beta 3, it means that we expect the row test score to have a higher area under the curve compared to the corrected one. And maybe this was too much abstract. Maybe you got a bit lost in the plot. So we also conducted a numerical analysis. So this means that we actually used a real data set. So we used the OASIS data set, which is open access series of imaging studies. So this is an uh, open data set with data about imaging. Actually, we didn't care about the imaging data. We only used a uh, few variables from this data set because in this data set, conveniently, we also had age, education, cognitive impairment, yes or no, and uh, cognitive screening test, which was the mini mental. So what we did was we went into this data set and we actually computed beta zero, beta one, beta two, beta three, and gamma zero, gamma one, gamma two. And then we got also some information about the distribution of age and education. So we then took these parameters and we created we just change them a little bit up and down to see what happens in different scenarios. And for each combination of the parameters, we computed what was the difference between the formula with for the R under the curve of the rota score and the formula for the R under the curve of the corrected score. So this plot is a bit complicated, but I think I can uh, guide you a little bit. So first of all, the color. So if you see red, it means that the R under the curve of the rota score is higher than the R under the curve of the corrected score. So red means rota score is better than the corrected one. Green means the other way around. So corrected score is better than uh, the rota score in terms of discrimination performance. And white means absolutely no difference. And then you have all the possible combination of parameters. So we have beta 1, which is the effect of age on the test score. We have gamma 2, which is the effect of education on the probability of cognitive impairment. Beta 3, which is the effect of the cognitive impairment on the test score. And beta 2, which is the effect of education on the test score. And gamma 1, which is the effect of age on the cognitive impairment. So let's see what happens in the different scenarios. So First thing to notice, if beta 1 is equal to 0 and beta 2 is equal to 0, then you see in these small squares here, all of them, there is absolutely no difference between the corrected score and the row test score. And this is something intuitive because if there is no arrow between age and education and the test score, if you delete the arrow or you don't delete it, it's the same. So this is quite intuitive. Second, uh, if gamma 1 increases in magnitude, which means it becomes more positive, and at the same time, beta 1 increases in magnitude, which means it becomes more negative, you see that the color becomes increasingly red as you go from the lower uh, left corner to the up uh, right corner. 
And this is because if these two quantities change in these directions, the flow of information that goes through uh, age in the non-causal path becomes stronger. And so when you remove that information, you have a loss of discrimination performance that becomes increasingly big. And the same reasoning goes also for education. So if gamma 2 becomes higher in magnitude, which means more negative, and beta 2 becomes bigger in magnitude, which means more positive, you see that moving from this quadrant to this quadrant and then to this one, the colors become increasingly more red. And this is because, once again, more information is flowing through the non-causal path that goes from D to E and then from E to X. And therefore, when you, we remove this information with a correction, we have a bigger loss in discrimination performance. And finally, if you believe that age and education are not risk factors for cognitive impairment, which means gamma one is zero and gamma one is zero and gamma two is zero, then you see that the colors tend to the green, which means that the correction is actually a good idea. And this is in line with what we said before and also the first rationale uh, that I talked to you about. So if age and education are not risk factors for cognitive impairment, then correcting for age and education is actually a good idea because you are just removing some noise. So I think I conveyed the message of why is a good idea to correct and why, when it's, uh, so when it's a good idea to, cor to correct and when it's not a good idea to correct. But why is this important? So here we have a, a review of different definitions of cognitive impairment, different from dementia, so the, really like mild, the equivalent to the mild cognitive impairment uh, that you can find in the literature. You can see two of the most known definition like the Peterson MCI or the new definition of uh, neurocognitive disorder in the DSM-5. And you can see that the definition of course is based on different, uh, of different aspects that you see here in the, in the first column. And I want, to I want to focus on the psychometric impairment. So this is how in that definition, the psychometric impairment is actually measured. So how, according to that definition, uh, you, are, you have a cognitive impairment from the test. And you can see that a lot of them actually use criteria that are based on corrected scores. So only by age or by age and education. For example, this is the one in the DSM-5 and uh, this is the one in the MCI, they all, when they say 1.5 standard deviation below the age and location match sample, it basically means minus 1.5 Z-score. And here you have typically one, two standard deviations below, which means a Z-score of minus one or minus two. So this is something that actually makes a difference uh, in the sense that based on the fact that you correct or you do not correct, you give different uh, diagnosis to the patients in the end. And there is also another aspect. So the societal impact. This is a paper that is quite unrelated to, uh, to the topic in the sense it's not really about cognitive impairment, but I think it shows a little bit the issue. So this is a paper from the US, uh, which is about workers' compensation claims to the industry. And the authors of this paper emphasize that in the US in general, white adults have better on average lung function compared to black adults. And the white adults have worse hearing functions than black adults. And what they found is when it comes to the assessment of the impairment for compensation purposes, they found that the compensation for respiratory injury is corrected for race, while the compensation, the assessment of the impairment for the compensation uh, connected to hearing is not corrected for race. So the use of the correction is used in order to discriminate black adults. And so they use the correction when it's more convenient for white adults, and they don't use the correction when it's more convenient for white adults. So it's a design choice and the fact that you use the correction actually makes a lot of difference. And you can think to a similar problem if you use the correction for age and education 
in the cognitive impairment screening setting. So if you don't correct for age and education, it means that you will give more diagnosis in general to individuals that have higher age and lower education. While if you use the correction, you will not diagnose individuals that are very old and with low education, because as we said at the beginning, uh, it's like if you are removing that part of the score. So you will first classify an individual that is older and with lower education uh, as cognitive impairment uh, much later. And this makes a lot of difference in, in the society in the sense that uh, the effect that it will have in the society will depends on a lot of things like what are the, uh, the finance, financial support and support strategies that are in place, what is the level of stigma, what is the level of inequalities in the society, but this is definitely something we should think more about. And before going to the final conclusion, I want just to emphasize two limitations. So in the old talk, I only talked about discrimination performance uh, measured as the R under the curve. So I didn't consider other metrics like the societal impact, the transportability or things like that, or sensitivity and specificity. And we also relied on a series of simplified assumptions. So we used a very simple DAG and we used very simple functions and very simple distributions for age and education. So this was done to make it easier to explain the problem, but the fact that these results were also found empirically in so many papers also shows that regardless of the level of simplification, the, uh, the issue with the discrimination performance is there. So the take home message. So age and education are well-known risk factors for cognitive impairment. And if you agree with this statement, then it's generally hard to justify the age education correction in real world scenarios, if you care about the discrimination performance. On the other end, we also said that the demographic correction should not be performed without careful consideration of the underlying causal processes and the societal consequences. So I personally think we should have a much larger debate on this choice because it has a lot of consequences in the real world. And finally, we also proven once again uh, that causal knowledge can inform clinical prediction tasks. And I wanted to thank my uh, collaborators, so Jess Roman, Max Bexung, Giancarlo Lograscino, and Tobias Kurt. And I'm also happy to tell you that you can find uh, the manuscript online on the uh, American Journal of Epidemiology. Thank you for your attention, and I am here for all the questions. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Marco, for this very wonderful talk. I always learn something new from you, even when I'm involved in the work myself. So this was really great. Thank you for all of you for tuning in. Um, also, for those who are listening to the recording, we're actually going to go into a Q&A session now. So we'll stop the recording here. We'll see you at the next uh, BEMC for those who are listening to the recording. And we'll open up the floor for questions.